mitigating factors, and these numbers are round, but they will give you some idea as to the size of the legion as it marched into battle. When it marched from place to place, however, it was attended by a baggage train of non-combatants numbering themselves in the thousands. So it would not be surprising to see a legion of 4,200 men marching through the countryside 15,000 strong. When actually engaging the enemy, the Roman tactics were straightforward. Each soldier was equipped with two spears and a sword. As they approached the enemy, they hurled the spears and inflicted as much damage as they could before meeting them hand to hand. And this tactic differs little in theory from today's artillery, which is supposed to soften up the enemy for an infantry attack. The Romans experimented with the composition and design of their spears, settling generally on an instrument that had a thin metal connector between the blade and shaft, so when the spear struck its target, the thin metal connector would bend under the weight of the heavy shaft behind it. And this served two purposes. It weighed down soldiers and shields that were struck, but it also made the Roman spears unusable to the enemy, for it was common practice in the ancient world to throw back spears hurled in by the enemy. When the gap between the armies was closed, the legionnaires pulled out their short swords, double-edged and sharp at the tip. This could be used either for stabbing or slashing, and were incredibly destructive in close quarters. The famous Gladius has not appeared yet in our narrative, which emerged after the Romans encountered Spanish swordcraft in the next century, but the principles behind that famous sword were already present. Once engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat, it was simply a matter of killing or wounding everything that moved until the enemy broke and fled. In addition to these forward, offensive-minded tactics, the new maniple system also had a built-in defensive strategy. If the front lines were overwhelmed, they could quickly retreat between the gaps in the middle line and regroup behind the more capable middle-aged fighters, and if they faltered, then they could all hide behind the third line by this time the first line would be ready to fight again, which allowed the Romans to retreat without having it devolve into a frightened, unorganized free-for-all. The phalanx lacked this element, and once it broke, it was every man for himself. The maniple system also had the advantage of being far harder to flank than a phalanx. Any attempt to do so would either be met by the cavalry, backline maniples ordered forward, or by frontline maniples themselves peeled off from the main fight and sent in a different direction. All in all, it was a significant advancement from the phalanx, and as we will later see, when the Romans clashed with the Macedonians around 200 BC, the result would be a clear and decisive victory of Maniple over phalanx. But it was not just the system that made the legion so dominant. It's not that anyone could be inserted and the result would have been the same. Nor was it the case that the Romans were bigger or stronger than their opponents. In fact, in many cases, facing huge lumbering Germanic tribes, the Romans looked puny by comparison. Rather, the legions prevailed because of group discipline that became the nightmare of opposing armies. In general, ancient warfare was a passionate affair, with lots of yelling, chest beating, and frenzy. But the Roman legion was a cold, inhuman machine. They were never intimidated, and rarely broke ranks. Their comrades could be dying to their right and left, but the legionnaire himself seemed unaffected and kept moving forward. This was unsettling to say the least, and sapped the morale of Rome's enemies. The Roman soldier did this not because he was unfeeling, quite the contrary, the Romans were a passionate people. But in war, there was only one thing a legionnaire feared more than the enemy, his commanding officer. Roman discipline was notoriously harsh, though it was not without its positive aspects. It was based on a system of rewards and punishment that were designed to promote bravery and eliminate cowardice. Punishment ranged anywhere from psychological humiliation. For example, a disgraced sentry might be forced to eat standing up so their comrades would always know who had lost their standard, to scourging for, say, disobeying orders, and up to death a punishment that was handed down routinely when the actions of an individual put the entire army at risk, like, for example, to the sentry who fell asleep. He was stoned and beaten to death by his comrades. Not a pretty sight, but keeping watch was a sacred trust that could not be breached under any circumstances. It was simply too important. On the flip side, the Romans invented a plethora of fancy medals and awards given out to soldiers who distinguished themselves in battle.
I've already talked about the grass crown given to a soldier who saves an entire legion, but there were literally hundreds of other honors. For example, an award was given to the first man over a wall when the army was assaulting an enemy camp or city. And this was not taken lightly. For whole centuries, lines and legions took it as a matter of great pride when one of their own took the prize. So when competing claims were brought to the attention of a commander, great care had to be taken in adjudicating the decision because tempers were always running hot when awards were on the line. The most common rewards range from double rations, a huge motivator, to promises of more land when released from service, to heads of cattle. Anything a soldier valued would be metered out for instances of selfless bravery, which the Roman commanders were always promoting. There was a darkly humorous case during the Second Punic War of a commander promising extra rations for every enemy head brought back to camp. But the soldiers became so burdened by the work of beheading and carrying heads that they began to actually lose the fight. And in the heat of battle, the commander had to issue a proclamation that everyone would receive extra rations regardless of the heads, but they did have to actually win the fight, which the soldiers, now free of their grisly baggage, promptly did. This discipline allowed the Romans to keep their cool in battle and keep plugging away rather than running. They knew what would happen if their corpse was found on the field with a wound in the back. They would be buried without honor and their family would be ostracized. Those who fled from Cannae, one of the greatest defeats in Roman history, were never allowed to return home, remaining in exile, fighting in Sicily until finally they were allowed to serve as bait for Hannibal and die with dignity in a suicide mission something they had pleaded for for years and were finally granted. The last thing I want to impress upon you about the superiority of the Roman legion over enemy forces was their meticulous attention to detail. It is often said that amateurs study tactics, but professionals study logistics, and the Romans embodied this belief. They took great care to always preserve supply lines, communication lines, and set up their camps in the most defensible possible position. This last was critical because the Greeks, for example, set up their camps to simply be close to the site of battle without thought to any other practical considerations. The Romans, however, took great care in ensuring they held the high ground and were in a well-defensible spot. A routed Roman army often staved off final defeat behind the walls of their camps, and many Roman victories were secured by overrunning the poorly constructed camps of their enemies. The Romans always scouted and protected sources of food and fresh water, and, knowing that this often meant the difference between a strong army in the field and a weak one, always sought to cut off the food and water supplies of their enemies before engaging in battle. Battles were often won or lost based on nothing more than the existence of a good breakfast on the day of the battle. So as much time as they spent trying to figure out how to neutralize opposing cavalry, they spent ten times as much time thinking about how to secure pasture land for their horses. It was the boring details of making sure everyone had proper footwear and that the trenches were dug to a proper depth that really set the Romans apart from their enemies, who often had every intention of just showing up for a fight. The Romans never just showed up for a fight. They planned everything down to the smallest detail. The fight itself became almost an afterthought. So there you have it. That, in a nutshell, is the Roman Legion of the Republic. Three lines, made up of units of 120 men, with cavalry and allies protecting the wings. More versatile than the phalanx, the maniple system would remain largely unchanged for the next 250 years, and it would be this incarnation of the Legion that did most of the heavy lifting of the territorial expansion throughout the Mediterranean. When we get to Marius, I will discuss at length the changes he introduced and how they changed the face of Rome forever. But that is for another time. Next week we will get back into the action as Rome prepares for her longest and most grueling challenge to date, the second or great Samnite War. of Rome. The Romans enjoyed ten years of peace after the end of the Latin War in 338 BC 
and spent the years quietly expanding their territory. This decade saw the emergence of a new attitude towards territorial expansion. It was no longer enough to merely ensure the survival of Rome by controlling Latium and fending off intruders. The Romans now sought to spread their influence over a much wider geographic area in order to draw taxes and manpower from a wider pool of citizens. No one power had controlled the entire Italian peninsula before, but the Romans started to think that maybe they could pull it off. They essentially looked around Italy, sized up the competition, liked their odds, and went for it. The Samnites were A number one on the list of potential threats, and the Romans knew that if they were able to conquer the powerful hill tribe, nothing would stand in their way of conquering all of Italy. However, the Romans were loath to simply expand, that would be immoral. The Romans only engaged in just wars when they, or one of their allies, was threatened. They would never declare a war unprovoked, it was considered barbaric, so they set about needling the Samnites into attacking first so Rome could enter the war it wanted honorably. They dispatched citizens to form a colony in Samnite territory, figuring the Samnites would either let them get away with it and the Romans would have gained more land without drawing swords, or the Samnites would attack and the Romans would come to the rescue of their besieged citizens. Things did not go exactly by Roman design, but in the end they did get their war. The Samnites were caught up at the time fighting the ground of the Roman settlement, so the Romans, emboldened, set up another. When the Samnites concluded their war with the Greeks, they did turn west, but it was not to directly engage the Roman colonies. Rather, they moved on the Greek city of Neapolis, which is present-day Naples, forging an agreement with its citizens to aid their dream of expanding off the coast and into greater Campania. The nobility of Neapolis, however, dismayed at the Samnite garrison and the loss of control over their own city, turned to Rome for assistance. It was the call Rome was looking for, but it was something of a letdown. Fighting the Samnites in Campania would not garner them any more land if they won, which was the whole point of provoking the Samnites. But, reluctant to pass up the opportunity, they agreed to help the Neapolitan nobility and drive off the Samnite garrison, which they did, sparking the Second Samnite War in 327 BC. The early momentum was clearly in Roman hands. Samnite allies were peeled off, and the Romans won victory after victory on the battlefield. In fact, the only major defeat for the Romans in these early years came as a result not of Samnite strength, but of a psychological mutiny by the Roman army against their own commander, the result of an extended melodrama which is too juicy for me to not relate in detail. In 325 BC, as would be the case in many of these years, a dictator, Lucius Papirius Cursor, was appointed to oversee the war effort, and Quintus Fabius Maximus, the grandfather of the more famous Fabius Maximus, who saw Rome through the early disastrous years of the Second Punic War, was named his master of horse. They set out for Samnium, but the taking of the auspices, a critical superstitious step for all Roman endeavors, had been done poorly, or was messed up, or showed ill omens. Whatever was wrong, Papirius decided to head back to Rome and retake them in an attempt to secure a favorable sign from the gods. He very clearly ordered Fabius not to engage the Samnites while he was gone, but Fabius, being young, could not help himself. The Samnites, knowing the Roman commander was away, were relaxed, believing no battle imminent. Fabius, on his own initiative, decided that it would be a perfect time for a sneak attack. He ordered the army out, routing the surprised Samnites easily, and captured their camp along with a great deal of plunder. When Papirius returned,